Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you all here, and I wish you all a very happy Sabbath and God's richest blessings. I also would like to welcome all those joining us over live streaming this morning, and any visitors that are here, thank you so much for joining us, and I know we'll, we'll be very blessed today. It is a wonderful privilege for me to welcome Pastor Keith and Danuta Stockwell here with us today. They are, um, they've come to visit us here from Maitland, from the Hunter Valley, and I know, Keith, you will share a bit of your ministerial background here with us just prior to your sermon. And for those that may not know, Danuta is actually, she grew up in this church. She's Lydia Kjanskevich sister and the sister-in-law to our elder Mirek. So it's lovely that there are family ties because that makes you come and visit us and would love to see you more often. So we look forward to um, God's message that you'll be sharing with us. Now a few announcements. We have some wonderful news. Um, this week on ch this past Tuesday, Lija Kotsur has finally been discharged home. After four months in hospitalisation, she's at home. So we just want to wish you, I know Lija and Albin, you are watching us. We send our love to you and a big wave and a hello. And um, I know there's a lot of answered prayers and Lija and Albin also send their love to the church for all the support that they have received throughout this difficult time of illness. Uh, this afternoon at 3 p.m., Pastor Ricardo will be facilitating a special uh, seminar on, on how to prepare a sermon and also, um, also how to give some Bible studies. So I believe this will be about one hour. So for all those interested, please come and join us today at College Park at 3 p.m. Next week, we are hoping to have soup and buns. And um, just last night, I think majority of you, as I can see, um, I've said we sent a message on WhatsApp in regards to being careful and just looking out for each other during this time when the infections are, are more is are increasing, and um, uh, just to take care of each other. And for those that are able to, I thank you that you're wearing your masks, and we just want to keep each other safe. There's a couple of birthdays. Uh, Allah Baron uh, had a birthday, I believe, just this past week. So we wish her all the very best, lots of health and, and God's blessings for the years ahead for her. Also for Karol Shalbot. Karol, I believe it's going to be your birthday this coming week. And I think he's actually over the 9-0. I don't know exactly how much, but um, we won't ask. <laughs> But Carol, it's, um, we wish you much of God's richest blessings. And um, I've got a card here for you for the church. Also, usually we like to give flowers from the church, but Carol has expressed that uh, the money goes to uh, ADRA for ADRA support. So I'll just give you the card. Okay, and I'd like to invite Marek. Uh, he's got an announcement for us. Thank you. Dear church members, I just want to share with you a little bit of good news. God has blessed us abundantly in our Be Well program. Every Tuesday night, we have about 70 to 80 people coming for a hot meal. Uh, that has f helped us to form a really strong bond with many of the students that are attending, so much so that tonight they will have a games social evening in our church at 6. Tomorrow afternoon we have a cooking demonstration. Um, they just love vegetarian food. They love the vegetarian meatballs that uh, Chochak Shoshkevich made, so tomorrow she'll be showing them how to make them. But in sometimes wondering how on earth can we continue to cater to the large numbers, we are so surprised when God blesses us 
with donations of food. And this week we have received such beautiful donations of food that we want to share some of the donations with you because they are really in access of what we can use. So after church, if any of you would be interested, we have white and red sauerkraut, Polska kapusta kisona from Poland. We would love to share some of that with you. So just come into the dining area and we will gladly give you some jars of uh, sauerkraut. Also, we have two large bins of the most beautiful pink lady apples in the parking lot. Again, if some of you would like to help yourself to those apples, we'll give you plastic containers, bags. Just come, help yourself. It's our way of saying thank you for all the support that you have given us in the Be Well program. Thank you. I invite the congregation to stand as we sing our first hymn, Living for Jesus. someone standing beside you that's stronger than the one standing against you. And John 14, 27, we have the beautiful promise, God can bring peace to your past, purpose to your present, and hope to your future. I invite the congregation to kneel as I pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath day. And we thank you, Lord, that you always are standing beside us. Only you can give us the peace to our past, the purpose to our present, and the hope to our future. Lord, you are our shield. You are our wraparound protector. None of us on our own can withstand the enemy but you, Lord, give us the strength. 
We pray for the Holy Spirit to bring unity to this place of worship as we all call on your name together. We remember those that are unwell, that are sick, that are at home or are struggling through various circumstances in their lives. Lord, please may they also feel your presence. We pray for a special blessing today for Pastor Keith as he leads out to share your special message to us. Please also, Lord, bless the offerings that we will be collecting. May they be to your glory and to, be, and to multiply for your kingdom. Teach us, Lord, to humble our hearts and to learn to serve you and to do your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I now like to invite the deacons to collect the first offering that is going towards a local church ministry. morning church happy sabbath thank you for joining us this morning and it is such a blessing to be worshiping in this church building with um, each and every one of you um, it is that time of our service this morning where we'll be able to uh, lift our voices and sing praises to our lord so please join us in singing our first song this morning tell me the story of jesus
what a blessing Jesus Christ can be in our life. And after we've heard about his story, let's now sing about how fair and gracious and loving our Lord Jesus Christ is.
We are very blessed to have such a beautiful church to worship in. And my favourite part of the church are these beautiful glass stained windows on the side and at the back. We are so privileged and there is a lot of history in this church. And with that, there's also a lot of maintenance and upkeeping. So I ask the deacons now to come up and collect the offerings and thank you for your generous hearts. The children like to come forward for your children's story. Really, we're all just big children, those of us that are older. So this is something for all of us, but it's lovely to see you all. Those who don't know me, my name is Danuta, or known as Nooch, aren't I? As well, Auntie Nooch to some, to Maya and... Hamish. So I'm the sister of Maya and Hamish's grandmother. How many of you have pets at home? Hands up. <gasps> All of you. What have you got at home? I have one. Dookie. A pussycat? And a dog. And a dog. And Maya, you have the same? I have the same as Hamish. And what do you have? I have a dog. A dog. Who has something different? What do you have? I have reptiles. Reptiles. Do you have a snake or a blue tongue lizard? Both? A snake. A lizard, a snake, a gecko, and a dog. A frog. Wow, that sounds really interesting. Well, would you like to meet our pets? Pastor Keith, that's my husband behind you. Pastor Keith and I have two pets. Would you like to have a look at them? Have a look. Ah, that. Would you like to know their names? So the little brown one, he's a little staffy dog. She's a bit sooky when we pack to go away. She, she gets like, literally like that while she's lying there. Her name is Bindi. Bindi we got from a mission in Moree. She was only a few weeks old. So she's a little mission dog. And then when we moved a long, long way, way out to Burke, which is about 10 hours from here or 11 and a half hours from here, we got Benji from another mission just out of Burke. And he's a Labrador cross Great Dane, but he's more like a Labrador. You can see he likes to sit up and think he's in charge. Okay? But... If we wanted to feed Bindi and Benji, I have some food here. Some things are for people, some things are for animals. But let's see, can you help me? Would we feed this to Bindi and Benji? No, you sure? Why not? What, what is it? What is it? Bird food. How do you know it's bird food? Yes? Bird. Got birds on there too, but there's some seeds. That's right. Well, when we were living out, out um, in Narrabri, which is about six hours, well, a long way from here too, we used to have about 14 different types of birds come down from the mountains. Okay, let's find something else. Maybe we're going to feed them this. That's for cats. Are you sure? Is everyone agree with that? We're not going to feed them that. No. Are we going to feed them this? No, why not? Who's that for? As for, for you, <laughs> for people, that's right, biscuits. Okay, well, sometimes they do like biscuits too. Maybe, oh, I've got two of these. We'll have a look. Well, maybe we'll feed them this. Yes? 
No, no. Everyone says no. Who's that for? Pussycat, isn't it? Okay, well, maybe, just maybe, we will feed them this. No? A carrot? Not a carrot? It's for rabbits and humans, that's right. Okay, but we're going to put the carrot aside there for a moment. Maybe we'll feed them... Maybe we'll feed them this. Does that look right? Ah, yes, okay. So that's a can of dog food. Pedigree pal dog food. Now, Bindi and Benji really liked that, or they used to like that, until we had six horses in our backyard. Well, not our backyard, but over the fence. They'd come over the fence. And what do you think we would feed the horses? Would we feed them this? We wouldn't feed them the dog food, would we? What would we feed them, do you think, out of these things here? Carrots. So we would cut up some carrots and would go and feed the horses. What do you think Bendy and Benji did? Yes, what would they want? They would bark. bark. They would bark at the horses. But out of these food, what do you think they would want if we went to feed the horses? Yes. The biscuits. Maybe the biscuits. But if I was taking, so let me tell you, if I would take carrots and they saw me carrying a whole bowl of carrots to the horses, they would run behind me and they would not want any of their food, this kind of food. They would want the carrots. In fact, they wanted so many carrots that they wouldn't even touch any of their food the next day un until they actually got some carrots and then maybe they'd have a little bit. You know, what we can learn from this story what we can learn is that sometimes we can be a little bit like that, that we see something that's being given or being done to somebody else and we might want to do the same. Now, the thing is, a carrot can't really hurt us, can it? No. Carrots are actually quite good for us, aren't they? In fact, they're probably better than some other things. But the thing is, it wouldn't hurt them. But do you think sometimes if we see our friends or somebody else teasing somebody else or bullying them, yeah, or bullying them. Yes, you know that. You've heard of that too. That we should do the same? No. When we see naughty things happening, we shouldn't do the same. But if we see something good, like somebody helping somebody else, it's actually good to go and help them too, isn't it? Yeah. So much like Bindi and Benji wanted to do something else that the horses were doing or that they were having... Yeah, we can learn something from that story, can't we? So Bindi and Benji still have their dog food. In fact, they like biscuits sometimes too. They like to have some of our food, but they do like their carrots as well. All right, you can go back to your mummy and daddy's, thank you. I invite the congregation to stand for the scripture reading. Today's scripture reading is taken from 2 Timothy four, uh, chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only for me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for your presence to be with us today and ask a blessing on our speaker, Keith. For those of us who are feeling anxious, bring peace. For those of us who come weeping, bring joy. For those who come here with doubts, bring faith. For those of us feeling burdened, bring rest. And we ask you this in your holy name. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. <clears throat> it's good to be in Adelaide for a Sabbath. 
Um, well, I like going into the state sometimes and it's really great to be here and good to be back. I call this my second home because this is my wife's home. Um, so I'm very privileged and honoured to be up here. Thank you for the invite to come and, and share a message today. I just want to share a few little things about myself before I go on with the sermon itself. Um, and I think this is... Yep. So I am currently the Atsum... Um, worker for New South Wales. I do the work of ATSAM, Aboriginal Torres Strait Island Ministry. So that is my position. I love doing it because I get out to work with all the Aboriginal people. Uh, not that I work with non-Indigenous, I love working with anyone that is interested in knowing Jesus. First of all, I want to acknowledge our God as our Saviour. He is our Supreme Saviour and he's our provider of all things. He owns everything that we that is inexistent. But I'd also like to acknowledge the Ghana people who are the traditional custodians of the, the land that we are worshipping on. Custodian means that they were caretakers, so they cared for the land. And back home where I come from, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about that, that's how we acknowledge it is that we were caretakers, we weren't owners of the land, we were the caretakers. We were given a responsibility of caring for country. So throughout the presentation today, there will be people, and you will not know them, but there will be people, you may, I should say, but um, there will be people that are deceased, so just be mindful of that. About me, I'm a Gomeroy man, Gomeroy country, and I'll, I'll show you a little map in a minute, and I'll give you an idea where, where that is. Uh, so that is where I'm from. I'm from northwest New South Wales, a little town called Narrabri. There's about 9,000 population, I think, 10,000, something like that now. Um, also, I'm a descendant of the Bellbrook uh, people over in Kempsey. So my grandfather was from over there. Uh, so two tribes, I, I relate to both of them. I've been a pastor since 2011. I got called to go to Burke. Uh, my wife mentioned Burke. We went out there to do work, a church plant, an Aboriginal church plant, which, which was farm. It was hard, it was challenging, had a lot of blood, sweat and many, many, many tears. Uh, but we got through that, Dale, and we're, we're here today. Uh, so just to share a little bit about the... Um, well, this is the map. So that's where I'm from. Gomil uh, they, they call it Gomilaroy. You'll see it on the map as Gomilaroy or Comilaroy. But the traditional name, you can take it from the Aboriginal man, it is Gomilaroy. So that is Gomilaroy, that's where I'm from. And we live over here, somewhere around here, over on... Uh, a Wabakal, near Wabakal land, country. Uh, <clears throat> so just a little bit about the work that I do. Uh, Bree Warren a Church, we've done a church plant back in 2014. It all began with these two lovely couples here. Both are deceased now. Um, they were both baptised by the, the, the late uh, John Lang, who's passed away now, um, and I had the honour of him assisting me with my very first baptism which uh, was a wonderful day. And the week after that, our church plan started. But Uncle Les, who had passed away last year, early last year, he had dementia. Um, he passed away. I couldn't go because I had a bit of an health problem myself. I had a, a stent put in. Uh, so my wife went out with these guys here who were pilots. Uh, these guys here, Gary, um, Paul and John uh, Cosmire and these two beautiful Aboriginal people that we minister to out in the West. Also last year we had a bit of a NAIDOC day at Lake Macquarie School, which was fantastic. The guy playing the didgeridoo is my cousin. Uh, he's an excellent didgeridoo player and very knowledgeable man. He's a, he's a pastor in his own right. Uh, myself with a few of the people at Lake Macquarie, which is a fantastic day. Uh, these are baptisms. I, I had, a, uh, I had a, um, a goal this year to get three baptisms. And there they are. They start, they, I, I think they finished around March, April. So I think I'm going to have to make a bigger goal for next year. But uh, these guys, what if, these two people here, the lady there and this guy here, I found out on the day that they were related to me too. So I'm, I'm finding my cousins everywhere that I haven't seen for a long time. And Taken lectures at Avondale College, which was fantastic. Um, uh, Dr. Erica Pooney and um, Pastor Neil Thompson. 
Uh, I've done Indigenous spirituality, given a bit of an idea of the Aboriginal, how, how we connect to the Bible God over the dream time by army. Um, so it's, just, it's interesting trying to bring that out. And as an Aboriginal man, they say, well, you should be believing in by army, but sorry, I believe in the God of heaven and the God of the Bible. Uh, Narrabri, where, where my ministry uh, finished in the West, uh, both our ministry, uh, I've always wanted to do an Aboriginal church group there uh, because I came from there, I was born and bred there. So all these people here are all new people. That's the pastor. This guy's my uncle and that's my auntie who's the uh, CEO of the Land Council. And all these lovely elderly ladies, uh, they all knew my mum and probably barely, barely remembered me. But um, the group has started, so there's a lot of work happening out in that area, which I'm, I'm, I'm stoked about that. But that's enough of the atom. I think um, we'll talk a little bit more about what I want to talk about today. I come here to share a message, and I don't come here on my own behalf. I come here as a messenger of what God has given me. So whatever I share today is not from me, it's from what God gives. Um, but I want to pray first. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, Lord, thank you, Lord, um, that you are the mighty God and you are the, the sustainer, Lord. You are the one that um, calls us to do what we are to do, Lord. Whether we're ministers, whether we're in the fields, wherever we are, Lord, you call us to this mighty work, Lord. Lord, I pray that um, you will speak through me today. Lord, I don't, I don't get up and do these things on my own merit, Lord. It's, it's all of you, Lord. Thank you for the honour honor to do this and to be your messenger. I pray this in your name. Amen. My internet keeps going on and off. I'll just turn it off because it wants to put log me on and I don't want to be logged on. Okay. Um, does anyone remember this movie? Now, a lot of you older folk would remember it. Does anyone remember it? No one? Oh, yeah, we've got a couple here. Cool Running. I remember watching this as a young bloke. I was probably in my late teens or probably early 20s. Uh, what a great movie. It was a fantastic movie. But this movie was based on real-life events. I didn't know at the time. It was based on real-life events about four Jamaican men who went to the 1988 Winter Olympics. And if you've ever, ever seen a movie, you'd believe and you'd see that it was a very inspiring movie. It inspired me a lot, even as a young man back then. It inspired me. But I want to, I want to explain a little bit about it. After qualifying for the Olympics, the Jamaican team got to have three runs. They had three runs on three separate days. The first run was a total disaster. The second run was excellent. And the third run, they crashed their sled. But I'll break it down even more. The driver of the Jamaican bobsled team, he was the main man, he was steering the, steering the, 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 the bobsled. He had this obsession. Obsession sometimes can be bad. But he had an obsession of the Swiss team. He watched the Swiss team and he thought, wow, they are really good at what they do. Now, when I look at Jamaica and I look at Swiss, what do I see? Heat and I see snow. So you would think, well, the Swiss are going to be good at a, a Winter Olympic. But the Jamaican guys were so obsessed, especially the driver. And, and, and they, were, they were obsessed of how good these guys were. So, so when, the, when the Jamaicans had their first run, they tried to emulate what the Swiss team had done, what they were doing. They tried to emulate the exact style of the Swiss team. And what happened to them? They came very last. They came very last on their first run of the Winter Olympics. So what happened after this? They went back and they, and they thought really hard and they sat down and they talked and they, they had these pep talks between each other and saying, what went wrong? Now, I know myself, when I do something, if I don't do it at my capabilities of what I can do, then I'm being fake. And these guys basically were being fake. They were trying to do something that they couldn't do. So they had this pep talk and they talked about it. And the following day, the, the second run, they went out and they came up on the ladder a bit. They got into eighth position. They'd done really well. But on the third day of the 1988 Olympics, the Jamaican bobsled team had a great run start. But not long after that, their bobsled cra crashed. Crashed, sliding down the hill. And these four Jamaican men, 
They could not ride a bobsled like these Swiss guys. They picked up their bobsled, bloodied, busted and bruised. They picked it up and they carried the bobsled and they went down that hill all the way to the finish and they walked over the line, finishing the race. They finished the race. How amazing is that? But my friends, anyone can start a race. You know that. Anyone can start a race. But the main thing is, is can you finish the race? Can you finish the race? That is the thing. We can all start races, but we, can we finish them? But there is a race of life for each and every one of us here today in this church. There is a race of life. And it's called the Christian race. And we're going to look at it a little bit today of what this Christian race means, what it means until Jesus returns. It's one thing to start a race, but it's another thing to finish. My mum always said, son, and dad too, don't start something that you can't finish. Mind you, there's been many things that I have started and I haven't finished. But we need to be strong until the end. Now, I've got my Bible verses on PowerPoint, but please open your Bibles, open your devices or whatever. Um, because, you know, don't take it from me or what the PowerPoint says. Take what the Bible teaches. And it comes in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at verses 6 to 8. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. And it says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Here we look at, at the final words of Paul the Apostle and he's writing to a young, young follow or a young student in Timothy. Paul is urging Timothy to be strong in his evangelistic ministry, to be strong and never, ever give up. But let's have a little bit of a look at the background of, of Paul here. Paul writes, uh, Paul writes the book of 2 Timothy sometime around 66 to 67 AD. It is written during Paul's second imprisonment in, in Rome. Here he was in Rome in the Maritime Prison. This prison, which still exists today, was a dungeon below the floor with a curved ceiling made of rock and a very dark place. It was a place for prisoners, obviously. And being underground, it would, would have been really dark, wet, smelly, wouldn't have been a, a pleasant place to be, but here Paul was. So why was Paul in prison? In 64 AD there was a great fire in Rome and 10 of the 14 districts in Rome were significantly burnt. Nero the emperor blamed the Christians for the fire, obviously. Yet it is believed that Nero, or Nero burnt the fire to clear a place for his palace quarters. Nero took Paul into captivity and the seriousness of Paul's crime implied that he would never, ever be released. I've seen a lot of crimes in my life, but never to be released for a fire. Nero was a young man and he was powerful. He was a powerful man, young, young Nero. And Paul, he would have been around in his 60s, an oldish man. Paul stood in the courtrooms in front of Nero and no doubt many people standing around with their cheering or jeering at him. But he knew that soon he may never be able to speak again. Paul knew this. So rather than being weak and scared, he stood boldly and he took the opportunity to speak with power and he uplifted Jesus Christ. No doubt he spoke of how Jesus died on the cross. Jesus' blood was shed for them that Jesus could forgive their sins and that Jesus could change their lives. Paul was faithful and he was loyal and he didn't waver one bit. He stood as God's representative. He knew that the truth will triumph over darkness. Do we believe that? 
Oh yeah, I believe that so strongly. Paul was filled with courage and hope and his words were powerful. You think of good speakers these days, how powerful they are. Paul would have been so powerful in what he was speaking, what God put through him. But even Nero, his heart was not even moved. Sadly, he rejected the prompting of the the Spirit of God. And that was it for Nero. But it's a serious thing to turn your heart away from the prompting of the Holy Spirit. The only safe place for each and every one of us is to follow Jesus and not to turn our hearts away from him. But my friends, how are you today? How are each of you today? Are you at the beginning of the race? Ready to start that race, and that, that, that Christian race? If so, keep your enthusiasm. Don't, don't allow your enthusiasm to go away. Deepen your desire and keep running the Christian race. Hold on to Jesus and don't, don't let go. Or are you partway through the race and getting discouraged, diverted or caught up <clears throat> with intricate matters that take your focus away from your journey, your journey of salvation is at stake? Focus on Jesus and keep running. We need to have selfless and self-sacrificing love. Coming back to to 2 Timothy 4, Paul says he is being poured out as a drink offering. But what does this mean and what does it mean for us today? This hints towards the Old Testament, particularly in Genesis 35, 14. Or Genesis chapter 35 and verse 14. Where, I haven't been changing these, is that... Where it says, So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. Jacob spoke here to God in Bethel, where he made an altar and he made a sacrifice. The Old Testament tells us, particularly in Genesis and Exodus, how the Israelite nation, God's chosen nation or people, had to bring a lamb or a ram for an offering, to the sanctuary when they had sinned. Can you imagine how many lambs would be in the world today if we had to do that? I reckon we'd run out of lambs. When referring to the drink offering in Exodus 29, it was a ram that they brought for sacrifice. When the ram was burnt on the altar of sacrifice, they poured out the wine around the altar, just like Jacob did in Bethel. The unfermented wine in the Bible symbolised the blood. The blood shed at the sacrifice symbolised the life of Christ being poured out on the cross of Calvary. Jesus sacrificed his life for you and for me. Amazing. No one's ever done nothing good for me in my life, by my wife. But for Jesus to do that for a sinful nation. Paul, by using this same term, I am being poured out as a drink offering, meant that he had poured, it, poured out his life in service for Jesus and that even until his death, life would, ref- life would ref- till the end. Jesus' entire life and his death on the cross reflected selfless and self-sacrificing love. Paul also poured himself out in selfless and self-sacrificing love. But what about us? Do we do that? Do we pour our lives out with selfless and self-sacrificing love? Don't run in vain. There's no point in running in vain. I don't run for nothing. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16, it says, 
in Philippians chapter 2, verse 16, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or laboured in vain. God doesn't want any of us to run in vain or to drop out partway through this Christian race. You've heard the old saying, you've come this far, just go a little bit further. According to the Bible, we are living in the last days until the return of Jesus. We know that as Christians. We know that time is very short, very short. The world has gone crazy. This is the time you need to stay in the race. Don't, don't fall away. This is the time you need to stay strong and look towards the finish in the race. And this is the time you need to have a strong devotional life. You need to have a life of prayer, a life of continually studying the word of God, getting to know Jesus. In verse 17 it says, Yes, yes, and I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Paul again used the same term, being poured out as a drink offering. But if your life is being, being focused on self and, and, and on narrowing God's possibilities in your life, the church life, or in the community, in your community life, rather than being focused on God's leading and God's potential, would that not be a concern for you? I know for me, I identify things. I say to my wife before she even pinpoints, yeah, I know I'm going wrong there. I need to snap out of it. God, through Paul's writing, is calling us to look beyond ourselves. Look beyond ourselves and serve others, bless others. We are to be selfless and self-sacrificing. When you come towards the end of your life and you reflect on your Christian life or your relationship with Christ, how will you reflect on, on your relationship with your family? I know I've got family that are neither here nor neither there. I pray for them every day brings tears to my eyes just to, to see where they're going, they're leading. What about the people outside your church or in your church? It's only what we do for Christ will last. It's only what we do for Christ is going to last. Paul knew Christ well and he did not fear death since he knew he would see his saviour again at the resurrection. Praise the Lord. How are you running the race? Are you living a selfless and self, uh, a selfless life and giving glory to God? Or are you living for yourself? I asked my wife when she met me, I was the biggest selfish man she could ever meet. Still got a little bit of that. But I'm growing, I'm learning. You might be asking, how can I live my life to the glory of God? How can I live my life to the glory of God? How can I run the race to the finishing line? Going back to uh, 2 Timothy, Paul tells us how to finish the race. He says the Christian life is a fight. Paul says, here I have fought the good fight. I've been in fights in my time. Very lucky to win a fight. But the Christian life is something of a real battle. It's a battle, the battle. And Paul, Paul recognised this, uh, that we all have a battle from within as well as around us. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, we all know this verse, Ephesians chapter 6 and 12. It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, against the rules of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul says that we can expect struggles in a Christian life. We spoke a little bit about that in the Sabbath school lesson today. This means that if you are having struggles, you, then, then, you, then you are running the Christian race. If you're struggling right now, you are running the Christian race. The Christian life is a fight because the devil will try to discourage you. He will try to destroy you and he will try to take you away from Christ. But you don't need to feel alone because Christ 
is on your side. He is on your side. You keep holding on to him. He is on your side. You may be knocked down, but never knocked out. I always used to say to my, one of my favourite cousins, he's on a, on a journey with, with the Lord, I'm, I'm having Bible studies with him, and, and I always say to him, Cuz, whenever you get knocked down, don't stay down. If you stay down, that is defeat. Get up. And my dad used to say the same to me too. Son, if you're in a fight, don't stay down. It's a show's weakness. Get up. And we need to do that for Christ. We get knocked down, we get back up. But the greatest struggle that we have is the battle of our minds. The mind can be a dangerous device. Once you get this terrible thought in your head and you replay that thought over and over and over, before too long it becomes to fruition. And all of a sudden you're playing it out. But what struggles are you having today in your life? But the good news is you cannot be knocked out. Christ is there to pick you up. Paul continues in 2 Timothy to keep the faith. Even though Paul understood and experienced the battles of the the Christian life and often faced great hardship and temptation, he preserved his faith in Christ and God's word. And that's what we need to do. Keep your faith. Keeping your faith depends on studying and following God's word. The sincerity of your faith depends on how you reflect the principles and the lessons learnt from God. Some people, and I fall into this bracket, some people can be addicted to searching on their computer or their phones or media, some sort of media device to, to feed their Christian life, the word, rather than opening up a book, the Bible, meaning the Bible. But what are you doing to feed your mind? Paul concludes in 2 Timothy, the rewards are finished in the race. Paul Paul had fulfilled the plan of God for his life and he didn't waver one bit. Paul looked towards the, the sureness of having a crown in heaven and of being in heaven for eternity. Paul says in in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, run in such a way that you may obtain the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain the prize. My friends and brothers and sisters here today, don't take your Christian life for granted. Please don't. I've been a worldly man. I know what's out there. And many of you have probably been out there too. Don't fail just before the finishing line. Don't get in a race and see the finishing line and all of a sudden you just sort of waver away. It's not worth it. Just in summary, summary of what I've been sharing, in, um, Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 4, 6-8, to, to run the Christian race with a purpose and not in vain, to live a life of selfless and self-sacrificing love, to fight the good fight and to keep the faith and finish strong. i just got a, a video clip that I want to share with you. Um, what I want you to do is just imagine, just there are three ladies, in, three ladies are the main feature in this. Um, just guys, I know there's three ladies, but I'm just saying you guys can pretend you are one of them as a man or whatever. But just have a look at these clips and, and picture who you are in this, in this clip.
as um, when I first seen that clip, I knew which one I was, straight away. We may be strong. We may be in a church where we look on the outside strong, as a strong Christian. But my friends, we can be that one in the middle, being carried to the finish line. Doesn't matter which way it goes. The point is we need to get to the finish line. That's the point. Regardless of who you are, we need to be getting to the finish line. You may have people in your church struggling. You may have people in your community, your neighbours, your family that are struggling. Help them to first find out that they can get on this race and then get to the finish line. But just closing, may God help each of us here today to be able to say in the end, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith, now there is, a store, there is in store for me a crown of righteousness in heaven. My friends, I hope we can all see each other there one day. Whether we're Aboriginal, Polish, Chinese, doesn't matter. As long as we're all there together and we finish that race. I just want to, in closing, with a song. Um, I'm not singing. I've got a clip. And I'd just like you to reflect on it. There is a picture of, of the work that we've done out in the West. One picture it is with a song that will go over it. And um, these people that you'll see in this picture, there are some that are deceased, but there are ones in there, the little ones, you'll see little kids that are now in this race, this Christian race, and they're still going to church out at Bree Warner, and some of them in their late primary school or early high school. So, yeah, just have a listen.
and there's a race. There's this race that's happening right now. Just emotional to see those people. That's where my ministry began. And I'm still out there doing things with them. But there is a race. We are in the race. But there's room for more to get in that race. Because bet your bottom dollar the race is going to end soon. And we need to be ready. And we need to have others ready. So I encourage you, church, find those people out in your community, get them in your race, because it's coming to an end. God bless. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, amazing God, you are an amazing God. Lord, you remind us daily, Lord, to get ourselves ready to get into this race, this race that is, that is on us, going on around us, Lord. But Lord, we need more people in that race. We need people of all races in this Christian race. Because we know, Lord, your Bible teaches us that it will be over soon. The race will be finished. Help us, Lord, as a church to be there, Lord, to be your mouth, Pete, peace, to be your feet, Lord, to be your hands, to be among the people, Lord, as you were in the scriptures, Lord, always among the people, encouraging them that there is a battle coming, the battle is raging, but it's coming, that be prepared to fight, Lord, It's not about a fight of life. It's about a fight of salvation, about a fight of heaven, Lord, of being with you for eternity, Lord. Let us not take that for granted. Let us be strong as a church, Lord. I pray this in your precious name. Amen.